Welcome back as we continue our journey through Luther's small catechism. That little book, that little book that's on your phone, in your hands, in your hearts, and in your minds from Martin Luther that explores the small catechism, which is the Ten Commandments, the Creed, the Lord's Prayer, Lord, the Holy Communion, Baptism, and the Office of the Keys. There's a lot in the little bit of book, but there's a lot that goes into our lives as well. So what exactly do we have here? Well, we're going to tackle one of our two sacraments. Two sacraments. What, is a, what does it have to be to be a sacrament? Well, to be a sacrament, it has to have two different parts. Number one, it has to have a physical element. It must be something you can see, taste, touch, smell. You know, it has to be physically there. And number two, it has to be something that Jesus commands us to do. That's why there's only two. Spoiler alert, you already know what we're going to be talking about here. One of them is communion because there's something you can see, and there's some touch, smell, and Jesus commands us, as we're going to hear in a little bit. The second one is baptism, and there's another companion video for that, so I'm not going to go down the road of what baptism is. But before we get into communion, I want you to pause for a second and think, what was my first communion? Now, I want you to think about that, because my first communion is a little unorthodox, we shall say. Uh, It's important to remember that I'm a pastor's kid, so what is about to happen may not seem that strange. But here it is. This is what I'm told my very first communion experience. Happened when I was two years old. Yes, two years old. Now this is what happened. I was left with the altar guild after worship, and during that worship service, they had communion. Communion at that time, they left the wine or the grape juice at the rail because you drank it and then you put it on the rail. Then they came by and cleaned up all the cups. Me, wanting to be a great helper, somebody who would really help the ladies at that point, I helped by going down the rail and sipping and emptying every single little cup. So needless to say, my first experience in communion with the elements, with the wine, was, shall we say, one of the happiest experiences of my life. Yes, I was a happy little two-year-old, very happy. I would guess that I was a little tipsy as well. But that's not the point we want to focus on. We want to focus on how happy I felt inside, how relieved it was to be filled with Jesus after another Sunday service. Now, I know there are other First Communion experiences that I've had. I mean, being a pastor's kid, we did have them on Monday, Thursday, even though we didn't have the official communion till fifth grade. On Monday, Thursday, that would be the one time a year we would get to partake in communion with my family until fifth grade. But think of your own. Now, I want, why did I want you to think about that? Because I want you to ponder, what exactly is communion? What is this thing we're going to talk about? What is going on in communion? What does it have to do with me and my life? Well, you're in luck. Glad you asked because that's Luther's first question. What is communion? What is taking place in this moment? Here's what Martin Luther has to say. Communion is the body and blood of Jesus given with the bread and the wine. And the words of institution are there. So, here we have it. We have, a lot of times here we've got the wafers. So we've got that. And we've got the wine. I'm not going to pour it in the chalice. Oftentimes it's already in the chalice. But we've got those. We've got the wine. We've got the bread. Sometimes we have the grape juice. But it also needs to have the words of institution take place. So what is? what are the words of institution? Well, the words of institution can be found in a couple places. I know a lot of you at least have heard these. Anytime you've come to worship, we have used these whenever there's communion. So I know you've heard them at some point. But you can find it in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And you can also find it in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. So at some point, I'd like you to open up to 1 Corinthians 11 and highlight 23 to 26. Here is what it says. For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took a loaf of bread. He gave thanks, broke it, and said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat of this bread and drink of the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Do this, do this in remembrance of me. Partake in the body and the blood, the bread and the wine and the grape juice in remembrance of me. That's what he is commanding us to do. So that is what communion is. It's a moment where we remember what Jesus did. He died for each and every one of us and he lives for each and every one of us. And In this moment, we can experience that, hear these words again, and know what Christ did for us. So what exactly would be the benefits of communion? 
Thank you for asking. Martin Luther also tackles that. What is it? What's the big deal with all this communion? Okay, I get it. I'm going to remember what Jesus did. But what's in it? You know, you could say, what's in it for me? What are the benefits taking place here? Here's what it is. You've heard these words, and I'm going to emphasize them over and over and over again. So by the time we're done with our time here, you're going to remember the words for you. Because given and shed for you. Given what? His body given for you. His blood shed for you. For what? What was the point? For the forgiveness of your sins. Yours. Yours, mine, all people. For all people, for forgiveness of sins. So that you may have life and salvation. In this, in this, there's forgiveness of sins, new life, and salvation. That's what's taking place. That's the benefits that you have. You have, in this moment, in Christ's death and his resurrection, you have life and salvation because he gave himself for you. The benefit we have here is we can see it, we can hear it, we can ex- experience it, and we can make it a part of our lives in this moment. And it's a very special moment. So remember that. Remember that it's for you. I, you're going to get tired of me and say, Pastor Zach, please stop telling me it's for me. No, not until you get it inside of you and you realize that this is for you. That's the benefit, that Jesus died for you. I'm, I'm sounding like a broken record, but believe me, we're going to sound it some more. But do you hear it yet? It is for you. That is the benefit. The benefit to you is it's for you. That's what's in it for you. So number three. Okay, so... If it's for me, how does eating and drinking do this? Thank you for asking. Remember, to be the be a sacrament, it has to have those two things. You have to have the physical elements and the words. So, again, it's not just about having the elements. This isn't a snack. This isn't a coffee hour or anything like that. We're not having some cookies, some grape juice on the side and saying, all right, that's good. I remember all of this. No. It is these with the words together. The words given and shed for you, for the forgiveness of sins, for life, and for salvation. That's what's going on. So it's those words for you with the eating of the bread, the drinking of the wine or the grape juice. That's what's taking place. It's not just the eating and the drinking. It's the words together. So in your hearts, in your lives, believe in these words that say they are for you. And you got it. That's what's taking place. That's what's going on. And I know, like I said, I'm going to be a broken record because that's the point. That's the point of all of this. That's sometimes why it's nice that we get it each and every week or most weeks. I think we do it three out of four right now, but you get to experience this in the moment. You get to experience the body and the blood, the, the wine, the grape juice, the bread, all of that together. And we know that it is for us. It's for me and it's for you for the forgiveness of our sins. So what do we have to do to be ready for this? Do I have to take a communion class? Do I have to do this? Do I have to do all of any any special things to prepare my heart? Good question. Thank you for asking. So what do we have to do to get ready for communion? Well, some of us have different things that we like to do. Some of us will pray beforehand. Some of us will sing the songs. Some will have silent reflections. Some will cross ourselves as we partake. There are lots of traditions and lots of Uh, things we do to help us remember what's going on. But what do you need? Whether you're one, two years old, 15 years old, 10 years old, 80 years old, and it's your first time, what do you need, truly need, to come forward and partake in this meal? Notice how I said there's a wide age range. Because this is what you need. This is what Martin Luther says. All of those other things are great. All of the things are awesome to prepare your hearts. But what you need is a believing heart. You simply need to believe that this is for you. That's it. That is what it says. All those other things are great, but what you need is to simply know that these words are for you and to have a believing heart, to believe that Jesus died for you, to believe that this is his body given for you, to believe this is his blood shed for you, to believe it in that moment as you come up and say, yes, this is for me, and I know you did this for me. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, thank you, thank you. A lot of times we have our confession at the start of the service. 
And that can lead us to a very grateful opportunity here to say, thank you. This is for me. You have done so much for me, Lord. Thank you from the bottom of my heart because I cannot do this myself. You did it for me. That's what we believe. That is what's taking place here in communion. And as Psalm 94 or 34 verse 8 says, Trust, taste and see that the Lord is good. Be filled as you partake, as you take that wafer, as you take that bread and you eat it inside of you. And you hear those words as the person looks at you. This is the body of Christ given for you. This is, it's for me. Or as you partake and you take the, the wine and you drink it in the cup or you dip it, whatever it is we're up to that day. And they say, this is the blood of Christ shed for you. You're right, it is. It's for me. He did this for me. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It can be a very emotional thing. And we hunger for it. We thirst for it. And there are times when we don't have it every week in which we might be saying, I really miss it. Because we want to hear those words. We want to feel it. We want to be so connected. And that's all we need to do is to believe with our hearts that this is for us. And Jesus did this. And remember that it is most certainly true. You don't have to have all the answers. You don't. There's two words you need to remember. For you. This is all for you. It's for me. It's for you. It's for all people. For the forgiveness of sins. It's a beautiful time together. It's a beautiful sacrament. I'm glad we can share it. Anytime I can look you in the eye. Anytime I can partake in it with you. It's a great day. And we partake with the entire community. We, the entire heavenly host. We, and Christ himself is truly present and welcomes you to the table. So continue to explore it. Continue to ponder it. Continue to be in awe and wonder of it. But I also want you to remember that it is for you. And as we get ready for whatever is next in our small catechism or your small catechism journey, remember that this is most certainly true. That's some good news. We'll see you next time.